Hello, welcome everybody to this last online immunometabolism seminar. Today we have a special one. It's a duo presentation by Professor Mia Netea and Professor Niels Riksen, from, both from uh, Radboud University uh, in Nijmegen here in the Netherlands. Um, Mia Netea is Professor of Experimental Internal Medicine at Radboud. Uh, and I remember I first met him at an innate immunity meeting in 2012 that he organized in Nijmegen. And to be honest, that was also the first time I heard about innate immune memory. And we have to say since then a lot happened. And me, I certainly pushed this field. Uh, and since 2011, I think you published at least 88 articles just on this subject. So we can say you are clearly pushing the field forward. And as a recognition and support, me, I received very, uh, a lot of prestigious grants and prizes. Um, Niels is also relatively close by here in the Netherlands, but we had to travel, I think, to Vancouver in uh, Canada to meet for the first time. Uh, we, wo we work on related subjects, uh, being monocytes and, and macrophages in cardiovascular disease. And Niels presented or published very na uh, nice data on innate immune memory in the context of atherosclero atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. So that's also something that he'll be talking about. So we have the double-edged sort of trained immunity. Mihai will first present for 20, 25 minutes about the beneficial effects, let's say, and then Niels will take over and will present on the detrimental effects in the context of cardiovascular disease. So the questions can be raised via the chat box and we will address them at the end of the presentation. So please, Mihai, go ahead. I look forward to uh, your presentations. Thank you very much and uh, thank you everyone for um, being together with us today and uh, being able to share with you some of our studies that we have uh, performed during the last uh, couple of years. And I would like to share with you some, uh, some of the data regarding the adaptive characteristics of myeloid cells and how metabolic and epigenetic processes are important for this, uh, uh, for this um, um, phenomenon. Why were we interested, first of all, in this phenomenon? And our interest came from studies that we have done with BCG starting approximately 10 years ago. And I just see that, unfortunately, my presentation is blocked. I will just, just one second, I will try to, to restart it the sharing of the screen. So I hope that now it will work. Um, we were interested in vaccination with BCG. And why is that? Because BCG is Bacil Calmedgeren, a, a vaccine that, that has been developed almost 100 years ago at the Institut Pasteur and has been used for tuberculosis. And something very special has been observed when BCG was introduced in the population. This is the first study reporting that upon introduction of BCG in the population, the mortality in the uh, children vaccinated with BCG at the age of zero to four years decreased from approximately 11% to 4%. This, is what, this was, of course, before the time of antibiotics when the mortality was very high in the circulation. And why was this uh, very special? Because the TB deaths were responsible only for approximately less than 1% actually. So this high decrease in mortality could not be due to uh, mortality through, uh, uh, through tuberculosis. Unfortunately. Yeah, so how can we explain that? This, this observation has been uh, made every time that BCG was introduced in more countries, either in South America, in, in North America, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And how this non-specific uh, effect uh, be explained, because it has been observed that respiratory tract infection and neonatal sepsis was much lower in the uh, children who received BCG. Now, if we look at how the immune responses take place, how the host defense mechanisms uh, uh, takes place, we traditionally divided in innate immunity and adaptive immunity. And innate immunity is rapid, effective, 
but it lacks immunological memory. So in principle, could not explain that, or, or, or at least that's what we learned about it. Whereas the adaptive immunity, which develops a little bit slower, is dependent on T and B cell uh, um, uh, cells, is very specific, recognizing specific antigen, and it can build immunological memory. But that cannot explain the non-specific nature of the, obs uh, uh, of the observation. However, if we look now at the immunological memory from an evolutionary point of view, something very interesting uh, appears. Only approximately 5% of all species on Earth, only the vertebrates have adaptive immunity, whereas all the other organisms, even very complex ones such as plants, insects, cephalopods, and so on, they only have innate immune responses. Now, innate immune memory is very advantageous for the survival of the species because it increases resistance to infection. So it is very strange then to observe that 95% of, uh, of the organisms on Earth would not have immunological memory. Now the question, however, is, this, is whether that is indeed true. And if we look at the literature in, uh, in uh, plants or in insects or in vertebrates, we have observed, however, that there is very clear adaptation also in innate immune responses. There is a process in the plants called systemic acquired resistance in which a plant being infected, if it is not uh, killed by the infection, becomes more resistant to that. And that in the complete absence of adaptive immune responses. And the same has been observed also for non-vertebrates. There are also some old, uh, old studies have, which have shown that in the absence of functional adaptive immune responses, for example, in severe combined immunodeficiency mice, there is also a T and B cell independent protection in certain models of vaccination, such as BCG. So we were interested ourselves to see whether we can reproduce these old studies and whether we can identify the mechanisms which uh, mediate this protection. So this is a study which we have done well, uh, almost 10 years ago, in which severe combined immunodeficiency mice were vaccinated with BCG, and thereafter they received, two weeks later, a lethal candida albicans infection. And as you can observe, the BCG vaccinated mice were protected against uh, systemic candidiasis. And that was associated also with lower fungal loads in the organs. Thereafter, we were looking and we were performing experiments to try to understand how is that possible. And previously, it has been shown that this is mediated by uh, myeloid cells, especially the tissue macrophages. And we asked ourselves, how is that possible? And now I'm just giving you the, uh, the summary of experiments that we have uh, performed looking at the epigenetic processes which modulate this protection inducing myeloid cells. When we have a naive uh, macrophage or a naive uh, monocyte in general, we have a very tightly packed chromatin in the nucleus. And this uh, tight chromatin is very difficult to read. It is very difficult, for example, to read also a closed book. So if we need to read the book, we open the book, we have to look exactly at the page that we need. And in, in DNA terms, it, this happens by methylating or acetylating histones in the chromatin. And by doing that, the chromatin gets more open, the transcription factors can bind easier to the, uh, to the DNA and initiate uh, transcription. However, when, we, uh, when the infection is eliminated, this is happening during the acute process. When the infection is eliminated, however, the gene transcription goes down again. And uh, the, chromatin, uh, the chromatin accessibility decreases as well. However, there are some chemical modification in the histones, especially methylation of histone 3, which remains even after elimination of the infection. And this is like a bookmark on the right places that need to be read during an infection. So when the organism is reinfected, the myeloid cells is re-exposed to a pathogen, the chromatin can open easier, quicker at the right places, high gene expression of genes which are important for host defense mechanisms can, uh, uh, can take place in a more efficient way, and thus the organism can be protected. We have shown that thus 
that these high level of, of histone modifications can keep the chromatin open and upon the second infection can lead to an improved innate immune response. And this improved innate immune response can protect against infection. What is, however, very important to say is the fact that this response to a secondary infection is not specific. It can happen also to a different type of infection the second time, so not necessarily to the same infection which took place uh, um, uh, during the initial stimulation. We were thus interested to understand in case of beta-glucan, but also other, other components of uh, microorganisms, such as beta-glucans, uh, fungal uh, microorganisms, induce the same uh, type of process. And we were interested to understand which are the genes, which are the processes in which the chromatin is, uh, is uh, uh, targeted, in which the chromatin is more open upon the initial infection or vaccination. And we performed a, a simple experiments in which we expose monocytes to beta-glucan or BCG or LPS to induce, uh, to induce um, uh, gene tolerance. And thereafter, we watched the stimulus after 24 hours and before the secondary stimulation, we looked at several markers of open chromatin, such as monomethylation of lysine 4 of histone 3, or 3 methylation, or acetylation of lysine 27 of histone 3. And then we looked at the, uh, at the beta glucan uh, primed or trained cells to see which are the regions of the chromosomes of the, of the DNA in which the chromatin is more open. And then we analyze, we perform pathway analysis of this loci. And what we have observed that there is open chromatin in a lot of genes and pathways which are important for innate immune responses, inflammation, toll-like receptors, integrin signalins, uh, cytokines, and so on. But at the same time, there were also a lot of genes important for cellular metabolisms which were, uh, for which the chromatin was more open, such as glycolysis, oxidation, amino acid metabolism, and so on. And then we asked ourselves, why is that important? First of all, we have looked at the metabolism of glucose, and this, uh, these studies are published quite a, a, quite a bit uh, 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 quite some time ago, so I'm not going into details. However, what we have observed is that the energy metabolism shifts from oxidative phosphorylation towards, uh, towards glycolysis in these cells because the oxidative phosphorylation um, and Krebs cycles are needed for other processes such as, uh, such as uh, uh, lipid synthesis. However, not only that, uh, that process is modified in the cells which have been trained with, with beta-glucan or with BCG, but there are also major other, uh, other uh, metabolites and processes which are modified. And this is a principal component analysis of the metabolome of cells which were either exposed to uh, culture medium or LPS, and we see that their metabolome six days after exposure is, well, very much uh, 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 similar, but the beta-glucan exposed cells have a very different metabolome. And in what way is this different? Well, first of all, as I mentioned to you, the glycolysis is upregulated. There is upregulation of pentose phosphate pathway, but there is also upregulation of cholesterol synthesis. And the TCA cycle, the Krebs cycles, is replenished through glutamine. Glutamine forms glutamate, then alpha-ketoglutarate or 2-oxoglutarate, and then accumulates succinate and fumarate. And we asked ourselves, why would the cells accumulate fumarate, for example? That, that is very uh, peculiar in a way. Now, that is, however, to be explained much easier if we look in the literature and observe that both succinate and fumarate are inhibitory factors for important histone demethylases, such as Jumanji C and KDM5. And then we studied the function of these uh, demethylases in cells which were trained with beta-glucan or BCG. What we have observed is that Jumanji C was normal, but the activity of the KDM5 demethylases, which are inhibited, demethylases, which are inhibited by fumarate, can also be very strongly inhibited by beta-glucan. And what is this demethylase doing? It, this demethylase is demethylating lysine 4 of histone 3. This is one of the important marks which keeps the chromatin open. So we asked ourselves, if we block now the, replen the replenishment of, of the Krebs cycle and we block the accumulation of fumarate with a pharmacological inhibitor of glutaminolysis, such as BPTS, do we observe a downregulation of this 
boosting of the function of the monocyte. And that is exactly what we have observed. Beta-glucan or BCG are no longer effective if we block uh, uh, fumarate accumulation through glutaminolysis. And we can observe that this is mimicked, actually, this is mirrored also by a decrease in the open chromatin as assessed by H3K4 trimethylation. We can observe that blocking glutaminolysis decreases also the marks of open chromatin. Okay, this, is, uh, this, this process enables the cells to remain methylated. But what are the processes which methylate the histones in the first place? And we have a lot of uh, epigenetic enzymes, which are called writers, which take care of methylation, acetylation, and so on of the, of the histones. And we were interested in one particular uh, uh, methyl transferase, uh, SET7, because that is very important for this mark that we just discussed, methylation of lysine 4 of histone 3. And we asked ourselves, is it indeed SET7 important for methylation of this histone? And is it necessary for induction of trained immunity? And first of all, we have looked at uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are uh, uh, modulating the, uh, the expression of SET7. And we have observed that indeed, these polymorphisms in SET7 modulate the capacity of the cells to upregulate the production of TNF and R6. You can see here different allele in, in, gene, in, in um, gene variants for SET7 uh, SET influence the induction of, of trained immunity. We have also thereafter asked ourselves if we inhibit pharmacologically SET7, can we still induce uh, training, boosting of the innate immune function by beta-glucan, for example, or for BCG. And what we have observed is indeed, this is the control, this is the boosting of the function by the beta-glucan. But if we inhibit uh, SET7 um, uh, methyl transferase with CPH uh, um, uh, um, inhibitor, we downmodulate in a dose response uh, 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 manner uh, these effects. And this is associated also with decrease in both glycolysis and the Krebs cycle oxidative phosphorylation, which are downregulated uh, by, by uh, CPH. Also in vivo, if we take a SET7 knockout mouse and, in, and give a SET7 knockout mouse beta-glucan, we wait five days and then we inhib inject lipopolysaccharide, we can see that lipopolysaccharide can induce higher production of uh, TNF or interleukin-1-beta, compared with the mice which were not exposed with beta-glucan. However, if we repeat the same experiment in set seven knockout mice, what we observe is that this, uh, uh, this upregulation of the response is no longer taking place. So set seven is indeed uh, very important for the epigenetic processes that mediate uh, trained immunity. So this, uh, this, was, uh, uh, this was one of the important uh, uh, pathways that we have studied, gluta uh, glutamine metabolism. But we have observed that cholesterol synthesis is also uh, important for, uh, uh, is also changed during induction of trained immunity. And we asked ourselves, what is the role of this, uh, this pathway for trained immunity? And we started to block cholesterol synthesis at several uh, places in the, in the pathway, HMG QR reductase inhibitors, statins, uh, very uh, early in the pathway, 6 fluoromevalonate a little bit later, and zaragozic acid, one of the last uh, processes, one of the last steps. And what we have observed was something very interesting. If we block in the very beginning uh, the process of uh, cholesterol synthesis with fluvastatin, and all the metabolites downstream uh, go down, we inhibit trained immunity. However, something else happens if we inhibit the process a little bit later with 6 fluoromevalonate And for example, the, uh, the, uh, the metabolites proximal to this inhibition go up, such as mevalonic acid, mevalonate. And here we see actually upregulation of, cyt of cytokine production of trained immunity. Whereas if we inhibit one of the last steps, not much is happening. So we asked ourselves, would it be possible that this accumulation of mevalonate is actually inducing by itself trained immunity. And that is exactly what is happening. If we, in, in, uh, if we incubate purified monocytes with mevalonate for 24 hours, we keep them uh, resting for five days and then we uh, assess their chromatin. Also, we assess their uh, responsiveness to LPS. 
we observe that these cells are more responsive and the, their chromatin is more open, precisely as we have seen with beta-glucan. So putting together all these data, what have we learned? Is that there is an interaction in between the immunological pathways that we didn't have much time to discuss about, uh, pattern recognition receptors, um, uh, uh, signaling such as uh, uh, PI3 uh, kinase act, mTOR, HIF1 alpha pathway, which induce a, a rewiring of the metabolism. The, the energy metabolism shifts from oxidative phosphorylation to glycolysis. At the same time, there is accumulation of fumarate through glutaminolysis, which inhibits histone demethylases to keep the, uh, uh, the uh, histone open. Histones, which is opened initially by methylation of lysine 4 uh, of histone 3 by uh, set 7 uh, methyl transferase. And this entire process is amplified by the mevalonate from the cholesterol synthesis pathway through an amplification loop, uh, loop working through IGF-1 receptor. And this is uh, something that we didn't have time to, to discuss, uh, the, the, the mechanisms of mevalonate amplification, but it's working through upregulation of PI3 kinase pathway through IGF-1 receptor. How about now BCG? Is this also happening during vaccination with BCG? Because we started from that, and that is indeed what is happening if we purify monocytes from individuals vaccinated with BCG two weeks and three months after the vaccine was given, these cells react stronger to stimulation. And it's not only with mycobacterium tuberculosis, but also with Staph aureus or Candida albicans, so non-specific stimuli. This is also associated with, uh, with uh, changes in the monocyte epigenome. These are uh, open marks of H3K27 acetylation. We see one uh, of the important predictive pathways is NOD2, which recognizes peptidoglycans from the, uh, from the mycobacteria. However, very important is the fact that this BCG vaccination has an effect not only in the circulation, because the myeloid cells are in the circulation only for one or two days, and thereafter they are replenished from the bone marrow. But what we have observed in studies that we have done during the last one and a half years is that actually this process happens also in the bone marrow of, of the people who are vaccinated. This is a proof of principle clinical trial in which we vaccinated people and we kindly ask them to donate also some bone marrow uh, before and after the BCG vaccination. And what we have observed that there is a very strong bias towards uh, myelopoiesis and stimulation of myelopoiesis and the function of the myeloid cells in the hematopoietic stem cells of the people who are vaccinated with BCG. You can see here a full, uh, the, the RNA sequencing of the hematopoietic stem cells uh, 90 days after BCG vaccination, which changes uh, profoundly from the, uh, from the control cells. And this is uh, uh, going into the direction of, the, of a myeloid cell bias. Now, in the last two or three minutes, I would like uh, to point out where can we use this, uh, uh, this. This has been observed in epidemiological study that results in uh, lower respiratory tract infections. And this led some people to study the, uh, um, in, in the last couple of months, the, uh, the morbidity and mortality due to COVID-19 in countries with BCG immunization programs. There was some interesting observation made for example, this is a study uh, published very recently in leukemia in which they have uh, uh, reported uh, the much lower morbidity and mortality in the, east, uh, in, the, in the east part of Germany, which had still a BCG vaccination during uh, the communist uh, uh, period, whereas the West Germany didn't have it. However, these studies, and there are several of them published, are very difficult to interpret because there are many biases which are, uh, which are uh, um, influencing the results of this ecological study. And it is very difficult to, uh, to say whether indeed this, uh, this uh, association is a true causality or is just association due to other factors. Therefore, uh, uh, there, are, uh, uh, there are actually uh, much more important uh, uh, studies coming up, which are uh, randomized clinical trials, which have starting in, in more than 10 countries around the world, in which uh, uh, people have been vaccinated or are being vaccinated now, 
uh, with BCG and people will observe uh, whether a vaccination or revaccination with BCG can improve the responsiveness to, to COVID-19 and decrease morbidity and uh, mortality. And in addition to BCG, there are also other studies with a modified uh, uh, um, uh, modified BCG containing listeria lysine. Uh, there are trials in, in Germany and India. And also there is a, a study being prepared with oral polio vaccine uh, in the United States because oral polio vaccine has also these uh, clear um, uh, um, heterologous effects on other infections. What we hope with this vaccination is to obtain actually an improvement of the, of the innate immune responses which would decrease viremia in the infected individuals when they get the virus. And then this lower viremia uh, uh, systemically will lead to lower inflammation, low symptoms and survival. Whereas in, in a very low innate immune response can lead to high viremia, hyperinflammation and death. But we hope uh, by using trained immunity approaches such as BCG vaccination to lower these, uh, uh, the viremia and the symptoms in the patients. And in this way, BCG um, uh, or trained immunity uh, tools uh, can be used as a bridge until the development of, and use of a specific vaccine. In previous studies, we have seen that this protection induced by BCG is, um, is um, uh, active for maybe two or three years. So it is only a temporary protection, but this uh, gives us some time to develop and produce um, a specific vaccine which can protect thereafter for hopefully decades uh, in the vaccinated individuals. So with this, I would like uh, to end. Uh, thank you. And I will give uh, uh, the floor back to my colleague, uh, uh, Niels uh, Rickson. Yes, thank you, Mihai. Niels, I hope you can share your screen. Otherwise, Mihai will have to make you co-host. I'm not host now, but we'll see whether it works. Um, yeah, so can you see my screen now? Yes, perfect. Please go ahead. I will do okay. it. Thank well, thank you. you. Thank you, Mihai, also for introducing this topic. So Mihai convincingly uh, showed you that, that trained immunity can be beneficial in the context of recurrent infections and that this mechanism can be exploited using the heterologous effects of, of vaccination, for example, BCG vaccination. Um, but of course, um, in theory, trained immunity, so the hyper activation, the long-term hyperactivation of innate immune cells can also be uh, maladaptive in situations in which these immune cells actually contribute to uh, tissue injury and, and disease pathophysiology, for example, in, in atherosclerosis. So we argued that um, this training uh, induced by infections can, for example, uh, accelerate the process of atherosclerosis and that this mechanism can provide a link um, between uh, infectious diseases and the infectious burden and uh, the incidence of cardiovascular diseases, which is known from epidemiological studies. And secondly, um, it might also be possible that not only infectious agents could, use, could, could induce training, but also endogenous uh, atherogenic molecules that are present in, in the circulation, for example, so glucose, uh, lipoproteins, that can impact on the monocytes, the macrophages, or the progenitor cells in the bone marrow and um, contribute to these chronic inflammatory uh, diseases. So Siron Beckering, who, who is also in the audience, I think, uh, was the first to show a couple of years ago that indeed also these endogenous um, atherogenic particles can induce trained immunity. So she made use of this same um, trained immunity design that, that Mihai also presented exposed human isolated monocytes for 24 hours to not only beta glucan but also oxidized LDL, then removed the stimulus and re-stimulated the cells with um, toll-like receptor 4 and 2 ligands and showed that indeed cells that were exposed for 24 hours to a low concentration of oxidized LDL indeed had a higher cytokine production capacity. And when we had a more closer look at the phenotype of these cells, um, we showed that these cells produce more atherogenic cytokines and chemokines and also had an enhanced uh, foam cell formation when we expose the cells after one week with a higher concentration of um, oxidized LDL. So 
um, um, subsequent studies show that similar to trade immunity in the context of infectious diseases that Mihai just showed you, also in the context of oxaliel induced trained immunity, this is mediated by epigenetic and, and metabolic uh, changes inside the cell. And I will just show you some examples of the uh, mechanisms that are important for this oxaliel induced uh, trained immunity. So in the same study, uh, Siron already showed that there is an enrichment of this activating histomodification, lysin 4 trimethylation, on the promoters of these upregulated uh, genes in the OxLDL or beta-glucan-trained cells. And that the trained phenotype can be completely prevented when she co-incubated the cell with a non-specific uh, inhibitor of methyltransferases, MTA. So there was a complete um, prevention of trained immunity in terms of cytokine production as well as in terms of um, foam cell formation. So more recently, Sam showed that also for this um, OxLDL induced strain immunity, glycolysis is very important. So he showed using the seahorse technology that these OxLDL trained cells before re-stimulation had an increased um, extracellular acidification rate as a measure for glycolysis and also an increased oxygen uh, consumption rate. And subsequently, that when he blocked glycolysis, for example, with 2-deoxyglucose, but also with 3PO, he could prevent this trained phenotype in terms of cytokine production, and also in terms of enrichment of this activating histomodification on the TNF promoter. So you can see there is an enrichment of lysine for trimethylation. Uh, so these are the various primers covering the, the TNF promoter. And this is reversed when there is a co-incubation of glycolysis blockers together with OxLDL. And importantly, there is a, um, a tight interaction between glycolysis and this epigenetic uh, reprogramming because you can also see that in the oxaldeal trained cells, there's an enrichment of lysine 4 trimethylation, also on the promoters of these glycolytic genes, and that inhibiting glycolysis uh, prevents this uh, enrichment. So can we translate these findings in isolated human cells also to, uh, to animal models, for example, animal models of atherosclerosis. And I'm sure that a lot of you are aware of this paper from the group from uh, Eike Lutz, a very nice study in which he uh, exposed LDL receptor knockout mice for four weeks to a Western type diet, and then shifted the diet back to a chow diet. So you can see that during Western type diet, there's an increase in, in circulating cholesterol, which completely goes down during chow. Also, there's an upregulation uh, of systemic inflammatory markers that completely go down when you switch back to chow. But what doesn't go down is the cytokine production capacity of the isolated monocytes after stimulation with toll-like -like receptor 2 and 4 um, uh, uh, ligands. So there is a persistent hyper-responsiveness of these circulating monocytes. Um, that persists longer than the half-life of the monocytes in the circulation, as Mihai just mentioned, suggesting that this occurs at the level of the progenitors in the bone marrow. And here you can see um, a PCA plot of the RNA-seq data of uh, the GMPs, and you can see that indeed uh, during the Western type diet there is a transcriptional reprogramming of the cells that persists also in the cells that are switched back to chow, and using ATEX sequencing, they showed this was associated with an open chromatin um, uh, during Western type diet that persisted during uh, the switch to a chow diet, showing that there is a long lasting functional and transcriptional reprogramming of the innate immune system. So can we also translate it to the human situations of patients with atherosclerosis or risk factors for atherosclerosis? Well, the first study that was done uh, in that regard was um, also done by Siron in patients with elevated LDL cholesterol levels. So she recruited uh, a cohort of 25 patients with FH, so familial hypocholesterolemia. These patients have a very high circulating LDL cholesterol concentration, and these were treatment-naive patients, so they were newly diagnosed with this disease, and they were compared to a control group which was aged for, uh, matched for age and sex with a low LDL concentration. And she studied the phenotype of the circulating monocytes before and three months after lowering cholesterol with statins. 
So here you can see the cytokine production capacity of the, of the isolated PBMCs um, in the patients in black and the controls in white. And you can see that there is an uh, enhanced cytokine production capacity for TNF, IL-6 and IL-1 beta in the patients compared to the controls, which didn't change at all when we uh, treated the patients with statins to lower cholesterol back to approximately 3.5 millimolars per liter, also showing there is a persistent hyperreactivity of these circulating monocytes. So Siron um, subsequently performed RNA sequencing of uh, uh, the monocyte from five patients of five controls, and she showed a differential upregulation of approximately 150 genes, mainly uh, re related to inflammatory pathways that didn't change uh, or hardly change after decreasing the cholesterol with, uh, with the statins. And finally, she showed that just like our in vitro studies, this inflammatory monocyte phenotype was associated with an enrichment of this activating histone modification, A3K4 trimethylation on the promoter of TNF and a lower occupancy of lysine 9 trimethylation, which is a repressive histone modification, which again, both don't change at all by the cholesterol lowering with the statins. So um, let's turn to another risk factor for atherosclerosis, which is uh, stress, um, acute stress associated with myocardial infarction or stroke, but also the chronic psychological stress. And many studies, um, for example, by the group from Matthias Nijrendorf and Phil Swirsky, showed that these stressors can accelerate atherosclerosis by promoting the efflux of pro-inflammatory um, uh, monocytes from the bone marrow via stimulation of uh, uh, the beta adrenergic receptor by noradrenaline. And we thought, well, could these catecholamines, noradrenaline and adrenaline, also induce strain immunity in, in monocytes? And that study was performed by Charlotte van der Heide, published a couple of weeks ago, so you can all read it. And the first thing that she did is to stimulate human isolated monocytes for 24 hours to LPS with and without um, adrenaline and noradrenaline. And then she showed that there was a reduction in cytokine production, which was known. So it is known that the direct effect of these catecholamines are immunosuppressive. However, when she um, removed the catecholamines, let the cells rest and differentiate into macrophages and re-stimulate the cells after one week, she observed a trained phenotype in the sense that there was an increased production of these cytokines with noradrenaline and adrenaline. And this was associated when she used the seahorse uh, technique to measure the intracellular metabolism with time dependent changes also in the immunometabolism. So during this first 24 hours of exposure, when the cytokine production capacity was reduced, there also was a lower oxygen consumption rate and a lower extracellular acidification rate. Whereas in the trained cells that had an increased cytokine production capacity, there was a higher oxygen consumption rate and a higher uh, glycolysis. So subsequently, she performed several pharmacological uh, blocker studies to investigate which pathways are important for this trained uh, phenotype. And she uh, subsequently blocked the beta-1 and beta-2 uh, adrenergic receptor. So this is the beta-1 and beta-2 adrenergic receptor, and also the cyclic AMP PKA pathway. And she observed that indeed both of these receptor subtypes are important for driving this trained phenotype, as well as this intracellular signaling cascade through cyclic AMP and uh, PKA. So then she wanted to translate this to patients, and she recruited a cohort of 10 patients with a pheochromocytoma which is a rare adrenal tumor. And these patients are characterized by repetitive bouts of uh, exposure of these catecholamines. So uh, every day there is a, a high concentration in the blood of adrenaline or noradrenaline. And she compared them to patients with essential hypertension matched for age and uh, gender, age and sex. So in these patients, these patients had a higher white blood cell count, mainly due to an increase in neutrophils and a lower percentage of lymphocytes. There was no change in the number of monocytes, although in the subtypes of the monocytes, we uh, observed an increased uh, concentration of the pro-inflammatory uh, intermediate subset of the monocytes. 
So then she looked at markers of inflammation uh, and observed that there was uh, systemic inflammation in these patients uh, measured by an increased concentration of the high sensitive CRP and also the cytokine production capacity for some of the inflammatory cytokines IL-8 and TNF which was almost significant was higher in the patients compared to the controls there was no difference in uh, IL-1 beta production so then to have a more closer look at the phenotype of these monocytes she performed RNA sequencing of six patients and six controls and here you can see that there is a clear separation, a sex-specific separation. So these are the males and these are the females between the patients with pheochromocytoma and the control patients with essential hypertension. And you can see that there is a differential upregulation of various important cytokines and chemokines. And also when she performed chromatin immunoprecipitation to look at the enrichment of lysine for trimethylation on the promoters of these upregulated genes, she indeed showed an enrichment of these markers. So um, we showed that in vitro, in isolated monocytes, not only uh, microorganisms can induce training, but also endogenous uh, atherogenic compounds, oxidized LDL. I didn't show you LP little a, but we, we also showed it for this one, and the catecholamines. We can translate it into relevant mouse model of, of atherosclerosis and also to patients with increased risk for atherosclerosis. And of course, having heard the presentation also from Mihai and the effect of BCG on the bone marrow, it would be very interesting to also investigate the bone marrow in patients with uh, atherosclerosis. Thank you very much, Niels and, uh, and Mihai. Um, very nice presentations. And I, I really like that we decided to do it back to back because that makes you think about the different concepts in, in different ways also. Um, so there appear to be different kinds of training and there is also a, a, a question raised along that line. So there's a lot of factors that, that seem to train the innate immunity. And th this specific question is about possible differences between males and females caused by, by hormones. Is something known along that line that, that you know? Uh, in, in vaccination studies in, um, in, in Africa, in epidemiological studies has been shown actually that BCG, uh, BCG and other um, vaccines which induce heterologous effects do have a different uh, effect in, uh, in males and females. And if I remember correctly, I think that, that even stronger, better responses in females, I thought, uh, so uh, there are certainly uh, effects. The mechanisms responsible for that, as far as I know, are not very well uh, uh, studied. Uh, we have done ourselves some uh, a, a small study trying to look at some of the um, of the sex hormones and the impact on the immunological effects and and train immunity. There were some effects, but not spectacular. I don't think that they could explain completely what has been observed in epidemiological studies. So there remains much to be studied, I think. Mm -hmm. Maybe Niels, you want to follow up on this in, in relation to the male and female uh, effects in cardiovascular disease? I don't know, otherwise yeah. we can yeah. Well, I think that, that in addition to what Mihai said, indeed we, we tested the effect of several hormones in vitro on training. And one of the hormones that did show an effect was progesterone, which, which inhibited trained immunity and might uh, provide a potential explanation for the fact that in females, cardiovascular disease appear only later, only after uh, uh, menopause. One additional interesting finding that we recently did in the, in the cohort of patients with uh, obesity and risk factor for cardiovascular disease is that we observed that there was an increased cytokine production capacity of circulating monocytes in patients with a metabolic syndrome, so patients that have really are at risk for developing cardiovascular disease, um, but only in males and not in females. So there are clear differences in terms of cytokine production capacity between the two uh, sexes. Uh, but the mechanism in, in that study, um, when we looked at the various concentrations of cytokines, we, we couldn't find the, the, the exact mechanism which is responsible for these differences. Okay. So, I mean, now we, we talk about training as, as quite broad, but clearly there is a lot of different stimuli in using training, but I assume this is all in using subtle differences in training. Otherwise, when, when listening to the stress uh, 
uh, story, Niels. I was thinking, okay, in cardiovascular disease, this makes sense. I mean, there it is for sure a risk factor. But this kind of training is certainly not something we should try to push to solve COVID-19, right? So what, what, what are we learning on these different, different lines of training? And, and can we find specific effects or mediators that can push one system without affecting the, the, yeah, the detrimental side? So yeah, actually the, the, the double-edged sword, like, like you, you put your title. So uh, if, if I may say so, so train immunity is not one, one type of program which induces one direction of the immune system. It is more a concept. It's the concept that myeloid cells and innate immune cells in general, but actually some non-immune cells as well, can undergo adaptation. And this adaptation can be different. And this long-term adaptation, these long-term uh, changes in functional uh, programs uh, can be different. Uh, the beta-glucan or the BCG, so two microbial compounds, they can induce also a core response, but there are also important differences between them. And that is true also between endogenous and exogenous uh, stimuli. So I think this is one very important aspect. And the second important aspect is when to stimulate it and the, the right cell at the right place. And here is, I think, what you are mentioning. So some of these processes, if they are activated at the wrong place in the wrong, uh, um, by the wrong stimulus, it, it can lead to deleterious effects. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and indeed, it's, it's the, the induction of a kind of preconditioned state. And we, we now focused on cardiovascular disease and, and BCG use training. There was also a question related to, to how trained immunity uh, could, could affect type, Q, type 2 immunity and, and inflammation. So is there something known about, about uh, allergy and how the, the, the immune system gets maybe constantly preconditioned there? Are you aware of this? If I'm not mistaken, there are two or three papers published uh, regarding that and also, uh, let's say, um, the impact of infections uh, on, on allergies. First of all, BCG, for example, but this is probably not having to do with training, but with the balance between T helper one and T helper two it has been shown in several studies that down regulates allergic responses. On the other hand, um, there are also exposures, for example, in the, in the uh, respiratory tract with some uh, microbial compounds, which clearly prime or train the cells. This is, these are models, for example, with uh, LPS inhalation. There are probably also similar uh, processes with, uh, with, uh, um, with uh, fungal compounds such as chitin, for example, also from insects. Uh, from the, the chitin from the insect skeleton, which has been shown to induce actually very strong allergic reaction. And train immunity components very likely pre, uh, play an important role in that process as well. Yeah. Um, another question relating to the BCG is whether actually last week we heard something about NK cells, but the question also relates to NK cells. So, when considering BCG vaccination and innate immune memory, do these NK cells also get, get modified and, and pushed into different phenotypes that, that affects their future responses? Yes, absolutely. So we have done only a small study. Uh, we are not an NK cell group, but we wanted to demonstrate to see whether the function of NK cell is different also, and it is. It is very clearly different, very clearly uh, uh, modulated, upregulated by BCG. Uh, there are several people or several groups studying NK cells, I think, as we speak. Uh, in terms of NK cells, there are a lot of studies done, especially in mice with um, murine CMV virus, and also uh, looking at NK cell uh, after, after the CMV infection in humans, showing actually um, memory NK cells taking place, uh, epigenetic uh, processes which are involved in these receptors which are involved. There is a quite large uh, literature regarding NSACAL memory. Uh, 
-hmm. So studies from Louise Lanier and uh, Joseph Sun in United States, and uh, there are several major groups who are studying that. Thank you, Mia. Uh, a question from uh, Elsa Hagers from, from Amsterdam, actually. She she wonders whether there is something known about oral polio vaccination and then related to that severity on the COVID-19 uh, outcome. Are you aware? Do you know? It is not known yet anything. Uh, what it is known is that in epidemiological study, oral polio vaccination has all also shown protection. And in the 50s, uh, oral polio vaccine has been used actually as an anti-influenza uh, anti influenza vaccine in Soviet Union especially. And there are several studies and there were campaign actually uh, because, uh, because there were no effective influenza vaccines at the time. And in Soviet Union, oral polio vaccine has been used as an anti-influenza vaccine with quite some success actually. And that was actually at the basis of the of the rational to prepare a study. NIH is now, and people at the NIH and CDC actually, are seriously considering a study of oral polio vaccine in, in COVID-19. As far as I know, there is zero data until now, but there are strong epidemiological data of OPV against other, uh, other respiratory viral infections such as influenza. Right. Maybe, maybe a last question, and maybe you can comment both, both on this. That, that's actually something I was wondering when you were presenting uh, on the BCG and whether, um, or, and that the epigenome determines whether you respond or not. So this is in the context of BCG. And in the end, I mean, as an indi individual, we, you're constantly exposed to what, a, a lot of different stimuli. So in the end, you get constantly trained if you want. So, or tolerized because or, you or tolerized, yeah. So the opposite. Let's, let, let's call, yeah. Yeah. Maybe to tolerized is a kind of negative training, if you want, right? It's actually actually it's a different uh, different program of training because both in training and the tolerance there are genes going up and genes going down, sure. and we use for especially cytokine production capacity to say a cell is trained or is tolerized. But if we look at a totally different uh, function of the cell, different type of genes, we can say the opposite. So they are all processes of reprogramming of the function of the cell. And in terms of cytokines, some of them are training, some of them are tolerizing, but conceptually are the same. Right. So this, this epigenome, can this serve to predict whether you, whether you, how you, you respond to vaccination? And, and could it be informative in predicting whether you will become sick after COVID infection or that you will become very sick or not, not sick at all. I mean, obviously it's very difficult to, 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 to study because you probably can't profile the epigenome before, but do you think that, that for example, also with the, with the met metabolic syndrome, those people have a higher risk. Do you think that could be related to the, to the preconditioning of the innate immune system? I don't think personally that is the only factor, but it is one of the factors. There is genetics, obviously. There are differences in genetics, what we have. There are differences in just exogenous factors. How many, for example, in the COVID, how many viral particles do you inhale? It's very clear. And in fact, unfortunately, there were cases of anesthetists inhaling uh, COVID-19 when they were intubating patients and becoming very sick because purely of the, of the viral particle number. Uh, so uh, there are aspects regarding um, uh, some other purely mechanic things. If, if your diaphragma uh, moves well or not, you become more sick or not. I mean, there are many factors, but I do think that, uh, that epigenetic programs in innate immune cells, because they modulate and they control the way in which the immune cells respond, they play an important role. They have a role and one of the factors influencing the outcome, outcome of the vaccination, and in the end, also probably outcome in different types of infection, COVID-19 or whatever. Okay. Along this line, you profiled a lot of monocytes from, from many uh, volunteers, right? Um, do, do you follow up these, these patients and, and also related to COVID uh, infection? Yes, we do. Okay. Can we you don't have yet the data. We'll, we'll know yeah. in a couple of months. Okay, yes, very yes. nice. Oh, I, re I really look forward. That's something I was wondering. 
Um, I think we, we worked ourselves through the questions. It's also just five o'clock, so I think we will have to conclude. Thank you a lot uh, again, Mihai and, and Niels, for your time. I really enjoyed, I uh, also enjoyed the discussion. I hope we can organize a real meeting soon, or at least, let's say, after summer, where at least the, the people from the Netherlands can somehow um, meet again and discuss data. And um, I really look forward to, to, to actually see you again and discuss this, this interesting uh, new data with you. So again, thanks for your time. And I look forward to see you all somewhere in the future, hopefully in, in real life. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bye, Niels.